When we think of two-seaters produced by General Motors during the 1980s, cars like the Pontiac Fiero and Cadillac Elante come to mind, not to mention the Corvette. But an often forgotten model is one that was under the Buick mark. That model is the Riata, a low and curvaceous two-seat coupe and convertible hand-built in Lansing, Michigan from 1988 to 1991. With GM having produced less than 22,000 units, the Riata is officially in a unique group of rare cars that was assembled by high volume auto manufacturers. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the Riata and discuss how GM had high hopes for such an expensive car to produce. So pour up a glass of lemonade, kick back, and let's get down to the nitty gritty. Lloyd Royce, Buick's chief engineer at the time, identified an issue. Buick's affluent demographic was being threatened by foreign competitors, such as BMW and Audi. Those European sticker prices were more in line with Cadillac, much higher than Buick. Despite this, they were winning the hearts and minds of exactly the sort of prosperous customers who once had been devoted to Buick. Royce called for a complete overhaul within the Buick division. So far, Buick had an increasingly stereotypical old man's car image. A new line of turbocharged V6s came out, which led up to the Regal-based Grand National of the 1980s. Determined to convince the world that Buick was no longer an elderly person's car, Royce teamed up with product planners Don Sullivan, Tom Patrick, and Jay Qualman. 1977, eager to make the idea come to fruition, the team came up with a plan for a new two-seat coupe to be shared by Buick and Oldsmobile. Nicknamed the L-Body, it was to be mechanically based on the upcoming front-wheel drive J-body sedans, powered by a four-cylinder engine positioned amidship, much like Pontiac's P-car concept that will eventually become the Fiero. As far as the upcoming J-body cars, those were cars such as the Chevy Cavalier and the Cadillac Cimarron. Although the plan was to share many parts with the J-cars, concerns arose as to the feasibility of development and whether or not the project would be profitable. Royce left Buick in 1978 to become chief engineer of Chevrolet, and the two-seat Buick project was scrapped. As we mentioned earlier, Jay Qualman was one of the product planners that had teamed up with Royce. Qualman had now been promoted to head of Buick product planning. He recalled the idea of the two-seater and pitched the idea to Royce, who had now become Buick's new general manager in late 1980. The idea was a bit different. Instead of the J-body serving as the basis for the two-seater, Qualman suggested basing it on the downsized front-wheel drive e-body platform, which cars such as the Buick Riviera and the Oldsmobile Toronado rode on. According to the new plan, the two-seater would go into development and be scheduled for a launch in the mid-1980s. It was also taken into consideration that utilizing the e-body platform would bring the project's break-even level to about one-fifth that of the L-bodies, which made for a much stronger business case. So in other words, this new idea was seen as being more profitable. 1981. Around the summertime of this year, Royce then pitched the idea to GM President Jim McDonald. Thankfully, the idea was well received, and McDonald agreed that the idea sounded profitable and would be a low-risk probability. But this same idea also spawned interest for another GM division that also needed a two-seater, and that division was Cadillac. But we'll discuss that in another episode. In the early 1980s, nearly every GM division had its halo car, or will be getting one at some point in the future. Chevy, of course, had the Corvette. The mid-engine Fiero would be going to Pontiac, which began the development process as early as the late 1970s and scheduled for a 1983 production. And as early as 1982, Cadillac had begun working on its own two-seater that was codenamed Callisto. This project would eventually end up becoming the Cadillac Elante that would be scheduled for production later in the decade. Around this time in 1981, Buick was producing cars such as the full-size Electra, the Regal, and the fourth-generation Skylark, just to name a few. Not to be confused with Skylark, the Skyhawk was Buick's subcompact offering, riding on the H-body platform. Boasting rear-wheel drive and four-passenger seating, it competed with other sporting models, including the Toyota Celica, the Mercury Capri, and the Pinto-based Ford Mustang II. 
That was all fine and dandy, but the Skyhawk was far from being a Halo car. The designers had envisioned a totally new concept for Buick's future Halo model. The idea was to create an even smaller, more stylish, and low to the ground car that would only have two seats, just like the other GM models. This new car would not be a mid-engine rear-wheel drive setup like the Fiero. Instead, it would be a front-engine, front-wheel drive layout like the Elante, without being as pricey and ostentatious as that particular car. 1983. The final production design for Buick's new car was submitted and approved. Buick had a lofty goal, and that lofty goal was to cut down on the age of its typical core buyer. Around this time frame, a typical buyer was in his or her 70s. With this new car, Buick was hoping to attract younger buyers in their showrooms, those that would be in their 40s. And while Buick valued and wanted to retain its older demographic, it felt as though having a younger demographic at the same time would not hurt either. 1986. The project got the green light and in December of that year, the first pilot car was assembled at the Riata Craft Center. Seeing the new car in the flesh, it was a sleek and radically styled departure from Buick's traditionally conservative lineup. And it would not be marketed as a sports car, but instead marketed as a luxury Grand Tourer. GM wanted the Riata to have an executive level ride quality. Therefore, it was built with a fully independent suspension rather than a solid rear axle that cars such as the Grand National were using at the time. The new car was built on a modified version of GM's e-body platform. Although this new modified version was shortened, the platform itself dated back to the 1960s and was used over time as the basis for rear-wheel drive as well as front-wheel drive cars. In particular, the platform underpinned large luxury coupes such as the 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado and eventually the Cadillac Eldorado. In the late 1970s, the automotive industry was changing. Cars were now beginning to be built smaller and more and more were becoming front-wheel drive. To keep up with the industry, the e-body itself was downsized and became exclusively for front-wheel drive cars. However, getting the chassis to fit wasn't by any means easy. The downsized e-body platform was square and angular, which made it highly compatible with the boxy cars of the era. The Riata, on the other hand, was more curvaceous, so mounting onto the platform presented an issue. GM's design studio mentioned having an illustration, and it showed a top view plan of the rectangular chassis with this almost circular car on top of it, with four corners where the frame stuck out beyond the body. The chassis couldn't be modified, and getting it to fit under the body seemed impossible. Initially, no one in the design studio assumed the project was going to work, but after some tweaking to the body, the team was finally able to get the chassis to mount. The team had to make the body size more upright. Ultimately, this made the design look a little bland, but it was now compatible with the e-body's platform structural hardpoints. To bring back some visual distinction in that area, Advanced Design Studio 2 Chief David North placed a sharp crease along the tops of the front fenders, continuing through the belt line and rear fenders, and wrapping around the rear deck. It was mentioned that these design cues were inspired by the Porsche 944, although there were no apparent Porsche resemblance throughout the car. Once those development issues were resolved, upper management gave the project the green light. Located in Lansing, Michigan, the Riata Craft Center was a highly specialized and exclusive assembly line. This is where the new Riatas will be partially hand-built by specifically trained workers via a series of consecutive staging areas. As far as the paint job, that was left in the hands of PPG Industries, which also had its own exclusive line. The reason being, GM was looking to mitigate orange peel textures or paint imperfections that would often occur on cars of that era. The ultimate goal was to catapult the Riata to a new level of craftsmanship. January 1988. Production begins, marking the first model year for the Riata. The original $25,000 sticker price for the coupe was just more than half that of the Elante. Two years prior, when the first pilot car was assembled, 
GM has set lofty expectations for the Riata, wanting to sell roughly 20,000 units annually. That said, GM decided to load the Riata with tech to add even more to its selling points. Introducing an automobile that will change the way you think about two-seaters. Riata by Buick, the premium American two-seater you can be comfortable with. Being available for the public, the car had its share of unusual features for its time. The car displayed an all-digital dashboard. It even boasted one of the very first LCD touchscreens installed in the center stack of any other production car, foreign or domestic. The new tech was dubbed the Electronic Control Center and was similar to the Graphic Control Center which had debuted on the 1986 Buick Riviera. The driver was allowed to visually access and scroll through diagnostic information regarding the drivetrain and other vehicle operating parameters. The ECC even allowed operating the car's climate control system and sound system, which although mainstream by today's standards, was rather futuristic in the 1980s. The Riata featured twin bucket seats with a storage area behind the seats, featuring two lockable bins and a lockable access hatch to the rear trunk. It was known as the only Buick with traditional pop-up headlamps, not the movable covers that were seen on early Rivieras and the Skyhawk. Under hood was the 3800 V6. The transversely mounted 3.8 liter overhead valve V6 was pretty much the same power plant that Buick used in the Grand National. However, the Riata's version made less power, was naturally aspirated, and sent power to the front wheels. Starting with its first model year, the engine was rated at 165 horsepower. Made it with an electronically controlled 4-speed automatic, the Riata's V6 served as a midway point between the Fiero's smaller and optional 2.8 liter V6 and the more powerful, not to mention pricier, V8 that propelled the Alante. Having 165 horsepower, the Riata wasn't exceedingly powerful, but it wasn't necessarily slow either. Thanks to its low weight, coming in at roughly 3,400 pounds, it had a top speed near 130 miles per hour. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. One of the systems, in particular the ECC, had bugs and was even considered by some buyers as being defective. The screen at times would completely black out and once that happened, you could say goodbye to climate control functions or any other system that was controlled solely by the touchscreen. It was also this year, 1988, when 55 examples were designated Select 60s and sent to Buick's top 60 dealers. The models came with a black exterior, tan interior, and unique Select 60 hood emblems. Back in 1986, when the first pilot car was built, Jay Qualman projected to move 20,000 Riyadas annually. So far, it was falling short of that goal, with model years 1988 and 1989 combined only producing a total of 11,717 cars. For the model year 1990, the interior was redesigned. New was a driver's side airbag and optional CD player. GM took the electronic defects of the ECC into consideration. The issue was resolved by giving the Riata conventional buttons and knobs for the climate control and the sound system. 1990 also marked the first year for the convertible model. The drop top model was supposed to have debuted way before 1990, but it itself had undergone development issues. In this instance, it had to do with preventing the convertible top from leaking. The convertible top, offered in cloth or vinyl, was manually lowered and closed. Rather than a plastic rear window, it instead used a glass rear window with an electric defroster. GM was hoping that augmenting a convertible to the lineup would kick up sales, but that never happened. It was also this year, 1990, when the Select 60 program made a comeback. 65 white convertibles wearing unique emblems and a flame red interior with white bucket seats along with 16 inch wheels went to select dealerships. Many believe that the drop top Riata was the better looking of the two, but as we all know, chopping off the roof means sacrificing structural rigidity. Buick and the American Sunroof Corporation had completed an extensive amount of work to beef up the e-body platform in order to make up for the lack of a fixed roof. The convertible commanded a high sticker price, more than $34,000, which was nearly 25% higher than the standard coupe. For the 1991 model year, 
The L27 3800 engine replaced the LN3. It also received a transmission upgrade. This is when the power output increased to 170 horsepower. As another upgrade, the Riata even got a new ABS system with new 16 inch wheels. For 1991, a little over 2,000 convertibles were produced. Roughly 6,300 coupes rolled off the assembly line. The exact combined number of convertibles and coupes produced for that year was 8,515 cars, still falling way short of what was planned. GM paid a high price to produce the Elante. The Riata was no exception. Sure, it may have shared its engine with various GM models, which ultimately cut down costs, but its unique bodywork and specific parts made it a challenge to become profitable unless it sold in high numbers, which unfortunately was not the case. Series production of the Riata ended in 1991, with just a tick over 1,500 examples produced for that model year. In 2006, Motor Trend highlighted the Riata as a future classic, noting the Riata attempted to bridge the gap between Buick's traditional silver foxes and the younger, sportier boomers it had temporarily pandered to by combining the best attributes of a sports car and an exclusive luxury tour while eliminating the negatives of both. So why was the Riata such a slow seller? Was it because of the defective system such as the ECC? Or simply because it was a two-seater? Perhaps it was due to the Riata's size, or the lack thereof. If we study Buick's lineup during that era, we'll see that there were no issues moving cars like the Regal or Rivieras off of dealer lots. So what was so special about these cars that it was able to draw customers in? Customers that purchased Buick's had interior volume in mind. So in other words, people expected more space, which translates to more comfort. And that's exactly what cars like the Regal and Riviera had that the Riata simply did not. 1987 was the final model year for the Grand National. If we study this particular car, we'll see that it sold quite well in comparison to the Riata that showed up for the following 1988 model year. In comparison to the Riata, this car can be considered unpolished and unrefined. It sat atop the aging G-body platform that underpinned cars like the 5th generation El Camino, along with having a primitive suspension and a rather crude interior without any of the new tech that was found in the Riata. But despite all this, it had what buyers were looking for, and that was size. To put this into perspective, the Riata had an overall length of just 183.7 inches while riding on a 98.5 inch wheelbase. The Grand National Coupe from the same time period had an overall length of 200.6 inches while riding on a 108 inch wheelbase. But slow sales weren't only because of a perceived lack of size. Brand identity was yet another issue. Theoretically speaking, the Riata could have been a sales success had it been sold under a different label. For example, auto manufacturers such as BMW or Mercedes-Benz have a history of selling small, sporty luxury coupes and being successful while doing so. But such a type of vehicle being marketed by Buick simply didn't register with prospective buyers. Whereas the Fiero enjoyed a very successful launch and sold quite well up until its issues became widely known amongst prospective buyers, the Riata, on the other hand, didn't sell all that great from the jump. In 1991, production lasted a mere five months, and the final Riata was assembled on May 10th, 1990. Even before the 1991 models came out in the fall of 1990, it was already determined that the Riata was a lost cause. Although it was not an easy decision for GM officials to make, the call for the cancellation of the Riata was recommended. During the fall of 1990, Royce became president of GM. In the early spring of 1991, he made the announcement that the car he struggled so long to build was coming to an abrupt end. Out of the four model years combined, just a tick above 21,000 Riatas were produced, falling well short of the 20,000 per year Qualman had projected, as we mentioned earlier in this video. The end of the Riata didn't mean the end of the factory where it was built. The Riata Craft Center was renamed the Lansing Craft Center. Royce announced that the Lansing Craft Center would be assigned to building the company's show-stopping electric car, 
which eventually debuted as the 1998 GM EV1. As far as convertibles though, it would be more than two decades before Buick offered another one of those in their North American showrooms. Okay, and that concludes this episode. We hope you guys learned something. And as always, thanks for coming out to the show. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Until next time, this is your host, Rob. And thanks for tuning in to Antique Tags.